in Vietnam that would kill the rats, that would kill the jungle. They, they sprayed it to kill the jungle. They said, if the gorillas are hiding in the jungle, we'll take away their cover. We'll spray these chemicals. Kennedy did this. That was you know, part of his, he said, I'm not going to use US troops, right? Instead, he had Agent Orange chemical warfare, Green Berets, he made up the Green Berets, so they were training people, and selected bombing. And of course, the, uh, what he called strategic hamlets. More than half of South Vietnam's population was moved into barbed wire enclosed camps where they could not go out at night. And as soon as Kennedy was killed, Diem was killed in Vietnam. Many people say the United States was behind the killing of Diem, the president of South Vietnam. As soon as Diem was killed, all those camps were empty. People just left. They didn't want to be in those camps, but that was Kennedy's strategy for Vietnam. And of course, Johnson replaces Kennedy. And within a year, there's more than 500,000 US troops inside Vietnam. 300,000 more if you count the Navy, the medical teams in Japan, uh, Thailand, the uh, Air Force Base is bombing Vietnam. So Johnson created a uh, war that the Pentagon wanted, or so some people believe. <coughs> okay. Uh... Yeah. 
that the United States has poured in taking over governments around the world, as we talked about in Latin America, especially, but everywhere, Indonesia, Iran, Vietnam, Laos, all these places the United States tried, at least, or did something. Uh, is it a conspiracy? So, for instance, who did kill Kennedy? And if the evidence does point to certain people, but the way that is dealt with in the United States is people say that's a conspiracy theory. You're trying to tie the CIA and the military to something a few crazy people did. Or actually they said one crazy guy, right? Lee Harvey Oswald. They try to say he did it alone. Uh, so it's one of the tools in the way to keep the waters muddy, as we say, so that people don't have clarity about what the United States is <coughs> We spoke a moment ago about how the United States has never really admitted what it did in Chile or in Nicaragua, uh, in, in, uh, in Venezuela. It, it hasn't just said, OK, let's open, let's let all the information be free. Let's really come clean. It's never done that. It's, you know, rarely. If it does it, it does it in a, in a way that's to manage what's going on. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example where they have done it, and I'm not seeing one. You know, they just are continually hidden the facts. Okay. Uh... Assange was able to uncover 
what Chelsea Manning gave, right, all these documents that are signed and published it. Or Philip Agee. But I mean, there are, for every Philip Agee, there's at least 100 CIA people who are bragging about how many people they've killed. You know, how old I like James Bond. Or, you know, it's like, the history that is written is not a true history. So for instance, everybody in the room knows who's 007, right? We all know. So who was Agent 019 in the United States, uh, OSS, the free runner to the CIA? Who was Agent 019? I asked, I should say, American students. I asked, okay, you all know 007. Who was 019 for the US? It was Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh was a secret American agent during the war with Japan. He rescued an American pilot. You know, he gave the U.S. important intelligence <coughs> information about where Japanese aircraft carriers were. When they came into Vietnamese ports, those people knew they radioed to the United States. The aircraft carriers were here. And yet, this is before satellites. They needed on-the-ground verification. So, yeah, what you know, True, Herbert Marcuse worked for the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. His job was to read what Hitler was saying and what Hitler was writing and give reports to the US government about what to expect from Germany. He said almost all of it was thrown away, never used. But you know, many, and so Franz Neumann uh, also worked for the OSS. Many American uh, intellectuals worked for the OSS who were very radical people. But they felt the main thing was to defeat the Germans and the Japanese at this point in history. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. G is the student of Herbert yeah. Marcuse. Yeah. 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 yeah, he is a student of Herbert Marcuse. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm really grateful today. Yeah. <coughs> Meet my, because I, I, I'm grateful about critical, <coughs> yeah, critical uh, school of thought from Marcuse. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know how okay, came but yeah. And Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin. Yeah, I'm a thinker. But I mean, Horkheimer is quite different politically from Marcuse. Horkheimer supported the U.S. war in Vietnam. Yeah. And he said, just as we liberated the world from German totalitarianism, we're going to keep the world from falling under authoritarian communism. Oh, really? Yeah, more kind of, He gave speeches at U.S. Army bases in Germany, uh, telling the troops, we're on your side, we support you. Okay, his name is the... Horkheimer. Mama, yeah. okay. Mama, I think uh, also have a different perspective uh, in terms of war. <coughs> right? Say it again, Marcuse? Yeah, I think Mama, I think like Mayor Adorno and then Herbert Marcuse have a different perspective. Position, yeah. position. Political position. Yes, absolutely. Okay. I mean, uh, I think philosophically, Adorno was very loud. Because he basically said, what humans, what, what critical thinking means, always questioning everything. And questioning everything <coughs> is very radical, right? If you ask that there's no perfection, that it's always, he didn't say this, but it's something <coughs> like, if I want to go from here to the slide projector, and I go halfway there every time, Halfway, and then halfway, and then halfway, and then ha I'll never get there. Right? So it's the same with human society. If we want a society with no poverty, no injustice, no war, no patriarchy, you know, a free society, well, let's go halfway in our lifetime. And the next generation can go halfway. But they never arrive at the end. Because someone's always saying, well, what about this? What about that? And that's what Adorno, I think, really means. <coughs> Negative dialectics. Okay, okay. okay. it will be in the next. Yeah, I said the word. Okay, okay, okay. But if you don't want to ask something, 
let me continue my question. Is anyone here to ask? Is anyone here to question? Okay, let me uh, uh, question you. Uh, let me question your argument. Uh, actually, uh, the best of all, I, I'm trying to limit myself to talk about uh, attending event of students on the internet. You know, because it seems like academic uh, communities uh, seems like they have people who try to undermine the United States of America because the United States of America is uh, the power of democracy, uh, <coughs> let's say, uh, the father of democracy, let's say, some people say that. Uh, so it seems like if we ethnic America, they, uh, they say that it is conspiracy theory. <coughs> Mm -hmm. An objective, and uh, it is of course uh, because you you hate, uh, you just hate uh, yeah. Yeah, America. That because of argument, okay, that's the first one. And second one, actually, I like to ask you how uh, how the social movements, <coughs> how the political situation in the past uh, influence uh, social movement today, transform social movement uh, today, how the political situation in the, in the, in the, in the past, let's say, uh, the domination of the states in, around the world, uh, and then uh, how they influence <coughs> uh, contemporary social movement today. So what do you think about the formation of social movement today? Mm -hmm. uh, so, <coughs> could you explain this guy around the world and how they are influenced by the uh, United States of America today? Or maybe, uh, is, it, is, it, is it still uh, connected? Or, or is it still uh, logic to say that the United States influence social movements around the world today? Or maybe, Good question. I think um, the United States movement is very weak these days, I feel. Black Lives Matter was a huge movement, but it, it rose rapidly and fell. And the leaders of Black Lives Matter have been shown to be corrupt. They took tens of millions of dollars, they bought multiple homes. Uh, but what's interesting about the United States is the creativity of its sectors. When you look at what's transformed societies in the last 20 years, it's got to be the personal computer. And where did the personal computer come from? We can trace it to American social movements. The people, uh, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, these people were using the freedom of young people that was really hard fought uh, to win, for instance, an end to military service, compulsory military service, uh, to the links between the, some of the very key people developing the personal computer and American social movements are very clear if you look at who these people were. Uh, so how does the United States influence social movements today? I'm not sure. I feel like the world we're in is polycentric today. Although the United States is trying to be the dominant power in the world to have you know, its uh, way in the world, clearly China is a, you know, a rising power. The United States is a declining power. But when you say at the grassroots level, there's a phenomenon I call the Eros effect, right? Where Grassroots movement creates situations where many people join. So, for instance, uh, when the Arab Spring happened in 17 countries, how did this happen that 17 countries all at once had social movements where there had been a year earlier none of the countries had had social movements? And it was the suicide of one man, Mohammed Bugazi, right, a vegetable seller. And all of a sudden it was on Facebook, which is an American thing, right? It was, again, created in the United States. And so this is the way the United States influences 
social movement. That the social media has become part of social movements uh, to an ever greater extent. These grassroots movements are real, but the technological component developed in the United States is often central to their proliferation. So at, at its high point, the Arab Spring helped to create Occupy Wall Street, which was a movement. I mean, we had tried to shut down Wall Street 13 years earlier. But all of a sudden, in the context of worldwide <coughs> movements, it was, wasn't just the Arab Spring. It was the occupation of the squares in Spain, in Greece, and then Occupy Wall Street, all happening at the same time. People in Cairo said they called the pizza place in New York and sent 100 pizzas to Occupy Wall Street and said, we're doing this in solidarity with our comrades in the United States. So it was not the United States that was leading. It was Egypt that was leading at that moment. Uh, and of course, people in New York sent something back to, uh, to Egypt. I don't remember what they ordered and had to look at. But something like pizza, I forget if it was a falafel sandwich or something. I feel like I'm not answering your question. Yeah, I think you're, you're, you're already answering your question. Yeah. Okay. okay. But one more question before anyone? I think the first question about this page, US. Yeah, oh. can, can, you, can you answer the question? Look, man, yeah, it's yeah. so many people. How to counter attack to counter uh, people say that when we try to criticize the United of America, they say, man, you just hate America. You see America. I can't tell you how many people in South Korea said that. Yeah. They said, actually, you seem to be pro-North Korea. Because okay. if I say, this is what the United States has done, so you like North Korea. Yeah, yeah. Right? Something like that. Man. It's like, what are you talking about? You know, it's like, no, I don't like, you know, that people in North Korea, although when I went to North Korea, I didn't dislike the government much. The yeah. people seemed very loyal. But, uh, it's a big problem. I think the best you can do is document, have facts, mm -hmm. and just say, look, you know, the U.S. government in 54, 63, 53, whatever, these are, we know this, we know all this. Philip Agee made much of it apparent uh, in his book. He told the secrets. Mm -hmm. It's an excellent book inside the company. And there, there have been other uh, people inside the CIA who have written memoirs. <laughs> Okay, I see. Okay, one last question. Uh, okay, uh, Brian, sorry, I have a very question uh, to talk to you. I think this is really important thing because I have, I have, you know, I'm still surprised. Yeah. There is still one more person to talk, talk, talk about how to criticize the United States of America today. I think it's, it's, it's really great, actually. <laughs> yeah. I think this is really, really great. Okay, uh, Professor Jim, one more question. Uh, even though you try to prove that the United States of America uh, did devastate, devastate uh, damage uh, all of the uh, countries around the world, okay, to say, uh, to tendency to authoritarian regime, or whatever. But the problem is uh, the success or the failure of social movement. Let's say, uh, to some extent, social movement. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, have, have contributed to, let's say, structural transformation, mm. structural and systemic uh, change. Mm. For example, let's say, let's let's say honestly, United States of America, they have uh, successfully contributed to change uh, United States of America, right? To be more like, uh, let's say. Uh, uh, there's still uh, justice, there's no, let's say, uh, everyone uh, can, uh, you know, uh, fulfill their, uh, their satisfied basic needs of already, right? Mm. They can, uh, yeah, no problem with, with, with the basic needs, right? What about the, the, the other country, right? Like, uh, like uh, uh, 
as in countries, African countries, right? Middle East, Eastern countries, right? There is the problem of, in terms of uh, social justice. But Europe, United States of America, uh, let's say uh, Japan, for example, because I lived there a uh, couple of years ago. So I think even though they try to adapt what we call capitalism, right? Uh, the system of neoliberalism, of they adapted from the United States of America, but they can, uh, you know, they can provide basic needs for the people. What about like Indonesia, like African countries, like Middle Eastern countries? It seems like social movement uh, do not contribute to uh, to social justice. In our country, but in Indonesia, it seems like uh, uh, no, yeah, no change, yeah, no big change in our country. Uh, even though we have a lot of social movement from uh, <coughs> grassroots, grassroots social movement, uh, middle class social movement, like student movement, we have, but we cannot uh, change the situation. We, we cannot. Change uh, structurally, systemic change. Mm -hmm. right? like, what, what do you think? I think the, the structural changes are really on a world level. Yeah. And so Indonesia. I, 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 sorry, I interrupt you. Including Latin America. Yeah. What the fuck? They have right. social movement, great social movement since 1970 to, you know to undermine racism, authoritarian racism, <coughs> but they couldn't provide basic needs. Mm. They couldn't structurally change the situation. What did you I think it's a world question. It's not, in other words, one country alone cannot solve its own problems. Like Venezuela had oil. Yeah. And that was what allowed Chavez to spend billions of dollars to improve the lives of it. He really was on the road to a structural transformation of Latin America, one where countries, nations, would not be so important. Where what would be more important would be people getting their basic needs met. That was what was at the top of his list. Not that Venezuela should rise above Colombia, but that Venezuela and Colombia should work together and solve problems of poverty, illiteracy, uh, you know, disease, and, and this is. Something that you know religious organizations seem to be better at focusing on than political movements. Political movements get caught up in power and the idea of taking power, fighting power, as opposed to building up from the grassroots. One exception, let's talk about the Zapatista movement in Mexico. You know the Zapatistas, right? Yeah. And they really have come from the grassroots. Okay. They were the poorest of the poor. And this is something I was going to say about Latin American social movements. What's different today than compared to any time in the past is that indigenous people are in the leadership of Latin American social movements. The Zapatistas are just one example. Evo Morales is a figurehead. The, the Bolivian social movements are enormous. In Guatemala, the indigenous peoples, the guerrilla army of the poor, other you know, self-help projects, uh, pulling up communities by the bootstrap by themselves. They, these people were wiped out by the military that was funded by the United States. So the point I'm trying to get to is to say, if there's not structural change in the centers of capitalism, in Europe, in the United States, it's impossible for the world to be free because American corporations still take more billions of dollars every year out of Latin America than they put in. They're still uh, taking the capital, taking the money away from the poorest. And it's something that is part of the logic of capitalism, just as the destruction of the planet is part of the logic of capitalism. Can we save the planet as long as giant corporations have to make more profits next year, every year? If Coca-Cola 
has to sell more products every year, and it's already an enormous corporation, can we save the planet? If General Motors has to make more cars every year and make more profit every year, what about the planet? That's not factored into, just as human welfare of the poor is not factored into the equations of capitalism, of the system. What matters is profit. That's the bottom line. What matters is power for America, the United States, to maintain power. These do not have social welfare written into them. I mean, there are exceptions, but they're marginalized, like Bhutan. You heard, they say, instead of gross national product, is it gross national happiness? Yeah. It's like, what a great idea. Right? I mean, it's the king who's saying that. And it's like, so he's a great king, but the point is, Vietnam defeated the United States, but the United States broke Vietnam's uh, infrastructure. Vietnam has rebuilt, but it's rebuilt as a capitalist economy. It's not a socialist economy. You know, they, they do their best, like China, they do their best to make sure there's not absolute poverty. Look, China brought more than 600 million people out of absolute poverty. Mm -hmm. Think about it, 600 million, it's like, what? It's like almost twice, it's the United States and Indonesia together, right? <laughs> that many people. They brought out of absolute poverty, and it's wonderful, but it's still, it's a very polluting society. You know, na preserving nature is not part of the equation of their capitalism or socialism or communism, whatever you want to call it. So they do have social welfare written in. I think Indonesia might, on some level, have something like that. The United States does not, not at the national government level. I mean, certain, uh, for instance, San Francisco, a city, is offered, they're talking, it's a debate now, to give every African American who lived in San Francisco five million dollars, an apology for racism and slavery. Five million dollars, think about it, like, whoa. But it looks like it's gonna happen. Because um, almost all African Americans who lived in San Francisco have been pushed out. They were, you know, there was, it was not white people driving them out, it was the price of housing was too high, jobs were not there for uh, people who were, let's say, not into IT, not into uh, information technology. You know, for working class people, there were just no jobs. So what would they do? They would move to other cities to be able to live. Anyway, um, there are exceptions. Minnesota is talking about everybody having a guaranteed minimum, uh, I think $30,000 for, for every family, which is not much, frankly, in the United States, but it's better than uh, some people make. McDonald's, they say, oh, you know, they pay $7 an hour. Sometimes less, sometimes more. Let's say seven dollars an hour. That is fifteen thousand dollars. Fifteen thousand dollars a year <clears throat> that someone working at McDonald's forty hours a week would make. And fifteen thousand dollars. It's just not enough to pay rent and have food and you know to say nothing of having a cell phone, new cell phones. But believe me, that's still good. Then the reason. Indonesia is really, really. Oh my God, bullshit! Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, more than 600, 60, well, more than half of, of, of our population under, you know, uh, extreme, you know, uh, poor poverty line. If we try to utilize like World Bank, uh, you know, standard guidelines, sixty percent. Not everybody in the United States is okay. Something like 20% of the population, there's starvation. You know, people are starving in the United States. The homeless population is several million people. Um, just, again, in San Francisco, it's young African-American, 
went into a store, you know, a chain, not a small store, like I think it was Walgreens. It's like a chain, like a thousand, ten thousand Walgreens, and took some water and some snacks, and the guard shot them, killed them. That's like this, and the guard was not is not going to be charged. The district attorney said the guard was doing his job, and the, the friends of the of the person says he was nonviolent. He just wanted some food and water, and then they killed him for that. So you don't have an image. I think maybe Japan and Europe are better in that way than the United States. Thank you. Okay. Because the United States has the past wealth 
created machinery, created factories, created technology that makes the productivity of American workers so high. Um, I'm sorry, I'm still not qualified to talk. I need to learn more about Indonesia. But I think that some mm -hmm. uh, uh, method that you and uh, already as already adopt with the Indonesian government to its partners. So in Indonesia is learned from the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Still, <laughs> the right way, you know? Still the land, give it to the big companies. Yeah. What about Latin American experience? Uh, uh, what, what do you think? I mean, how they develop their country uh, from the past until right now? Well, the thing is, in Latin America, the European settlers exploited the native people, the indigenous people, terribly, brutally. If you look at the uh, destruction of the Mayan civilization, this is one of the great civilizations of the indigenous people. The Maya were incredibly sophisticated. They, uh, <coughs> their astronomy was very well developed, to the point where every five years, when Venus became very close to the Earth, Mayan cities would have the Venus war games. Instead of the cities fighting wars, the top five warriors, including the king and four of his best warriors, would fight. And the king, if the king is captured and killed, then the <coughs> city that won the war game gets tribute for five years until the next cycle. And the Spanish came, and of course, the Aztecs, another great empire, when they had a war, what they fought for, the Aztecs, was to touch the head of the enemy. If you touch the head of the enemy, you considered to have won. Huh. The Spanish were puzzled, but they killed. They didn't, and they had, of course, horses, and they had, uh, you know, weapons. So they fought in a very <coughs> brutal way, but they fought to win. The uh, Inca, which were truly an extraordinary civilization. Again, the leader of the Inca uh, agreed to meet with the Spanish. The Spanish hid everywhere. And when they came to meet with like 100,000 troops, and there were like 200 men, <coughs> The Spaniards were hidden around like every building, and then at the, at the signal they came and they killed people and captured the king. And they held him and then killed him, the emperor. So, that, you know, the conquest of the Europeans, of the native people, made Latin America a very difficult place because social movements that arose didn't involve bringing up the uh, let's say, the most oppressed. It was the middle classes that had these movements, many of them, like Bolivar. The Bolivarian Revolution, which Chavez proclaimed himself the, you know, as the leader of the modern Bolivarian, but Bolivar was one of the wealthiest landowners in the region. And he gave his full-on money and everything, but he still kept slaves. So, uh, African slaves, like, this problem today it has shaken Latin America like never before. You have indigenous people who are part of these social movements and leading these social movements. Like I said, the Zapatistas refused to take part in the government of Mexico. And even when there was an election with a very conservative guy and very liberal guy, they said, no, we have to change the whole system. That's our, what we believe is necessary in Mexico to get rid of the cartels and to bring up people with a whole different system. Not nation states, but ruled by the grassroots. And so what they're doing in their uh, catacolas, they call it like the, you know, a shell that is uh, in the ocean, a shell, like the catacol. They have, uh, I think now they have four. And these are self-managed places where people
people from the villages send representatives to be the government of the region. And none of the representatives can stay more than a few weeks, like six weeks. And then they rotate in new people. And the local villages elect the people to become the government of the region. And I, mean, I was there when the old people were leaving, and then the new people were arriving. They had a basketball game. First thing, they're like, let's not talk. Let's just play basketball. So there wasn't really continuity. It was more people were learning how to govern themselves. That was the point. And I think in every place, that's what needed is for people to learn to make the decisions that affect their everyday lives. We are too, I mean, we are too well endowed with computers, cell phones. We, honestly, if it were, if things were not so bad, would we be caring about politics? I'm not so sure. You know, I don't think we want power. I think we want justice. And it's very difficult to struggle for justice when all around you people are struggling for power and money. Mm. Right? Who's going to win that one? When you say, I want justice, and they say, I want money, I want power. Huh. It's like, you know, oh, well, I'm glad you're so well intentioned. We need people like you. <laughs> when we tell you people like them, right? It's like. Okay, why do you take the yeah. Well, thank you. You know, in the United States, political identity has a very different meaning. Identity politics. Uh, identity politics means that if you're African American, that's your identity. If you're a woman, that's your identity. If you're, uh, you know, Latino, as we, as we say, that's your identity. White people, that's an identity. And there are, you know, right. Uh, right-wing groups that are white, they say white power, white identity. Uh, and this is a real problem, because then, where is the universal? In other words, the United States, uh, in the 60s and 70s, there was the Black Panther Party, which united all of these, to what today are identities. The Black Panther said, you know, black power for black people, yellow power for yellow people, red power for red people, white power for white people. You know, and that today is a very controversial thing. Most residents African American say no, no white power for black people. And white people will say no, no white power, no black power for black people. You know, uh, it's, a, it's a real problem that Groups are pitted against each other with identity politics. Because of the idea of identity. Yeah. Okay. But in Asia, identity politics. Different meaning. Different right? meaning. And does it mean that people are against each other at the grassroots? Actually, no. No, actually. But, you know, for the idea of sometimes they use for the political elite. The political yeah, use this term uh, to oppose another uh, political elite because it uh, always bring about political identity issues because they worry about political identity to build like gains uh, to the amount of background, uh, various background of things to different. And then the message of political identity is about really can bring religion to the
that community. Mm -hmm. Go to a gay community. Like Sabadista. Right? Yeah, like yeah. Sabadista. Yeah. In Indonesia, we use that identity like Afghan identity. Yeah. Or like indigenous <coughs> people. This is the identity that we make it. And <coughs> as a social movement, we did like uh, not to government organizations. We always use it, that one. So this is, I think the problem is that we both and depend on who we use that political identity. Political identity is the good thing. If you use to for the good thing for justice, <coughs> not for power, but for money. So I think this is related to two theory. Right wing populism and left populism. Uh, right wing populism tends to utilize uh, conservative symbol to win election, and left populism tends to advocate uh, marginalized people like Sabahista or maybe part one in Indonesia. I think it's good right? based on Santa mm -hmm. Mook and Fernando too. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have to stop then. <laughs> 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 because. Uh, the Let's continue in harmonies. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give you a cup of coffee in our cafe. Okay. In our okay. cafe. Okay. If you have okay. time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so you are the title. Yeah, yeah, I am, yeah, 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 yeah. I am, I am the rich man today. <laughs> okay. I will provide a cup of coffee. Great coffee in our cafe. Right? Okay. 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 Thank you, Kauji, for your time and contribution for our uh, evening discussions and then <coughs> before for, for closing you can maybe you can mention you also have a presentation uh, oh yeah, yeah. well if, if people are interested in my writing you can go to erosefect.com erosefect.com yeah it's okay. all free yeah. they see books articles whatever it's Left coffee, not right coffee, right coffee left, right? <laughs> <laughs> coffee right, but coffee left. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, please uh, let's uh, give a big hand, uh, yeah. big round of applause.